deforestation from being imported into the EU. So as you can see, we're having a few little technical difficulties, so please bear with us while we sort those out, but not to worry, we'll get everyone online. Um, and in the meantime, let me give a quick introduction. So the rate of global deforestation remains alarmingly high, and the EU um, has its fair share of responsibility in this as the world's third largest importer of tropical deforestation and associated emissions. So in a bid to put an end to this EU-driven deforestation, the European Commission has proposed a new regulation which would require companies to follow a due diligence procedure. This would ensure that commodities and products they sell in the EU or export uh, from the EU are deforestation free. I won't go into too many details here because we have a range of experts um, and very knowledgeable panelists today to discuss uh, this in detail, explore what exactly this procedure needs to look like and what this proposal would mean in practice. Now, let me give you a quick overview of the event before we get stuck in. Now, this event is split into two separate sessions, the first focusing on the due diligence side of things and how this would work, the second on the traceability requirement within that. Now, just a quick housekeeping note, there will be a Q&A session uh, with all of our speakers at the end of the panel discussions. So do keep your questions coming in throughout the event. Now, you can submit these questions via the Q&A function, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. Not to be confused with the chat function. Any questions in the chat will not be picked up. So please do be sure to use that uh, Q&A function. And when submitting your questions, please do keep them short and concise and say who the question is for so that I can best target your questions. And the webinar will be recorded and everyone will receive an email afterwards uh, with the recording and also links to all of the studies and documents that are discussed throughout this event. Uh, so not to worry about that. Now, to kick us off, I would like to pass the floor firstly to socialist MEP and rapporteur on this file, Dalara Burkhart for some introductory remarks. So Delara, uh, the floor is yours, you have five minutes. Thank you, Natasha, for the introduction. Although I have to say I was the rapporteur of the initiative report and now I'm shadow of the um, of the Socialist and Democrats group. Um, but I'm very grateful to be here um, and thank you, Marie, for, for, for the initiative because I think it is a very, very timely a moment to to have the discussion because it's only one month left where we intend to vote on the PIMS position in the environment committee so uh, Maria and me and the other shadows we are right in the middle of the negotiations and the council is also in full swing the French presidency has made it one of its top priorities and it wants to have its negotiations position ready by the end of this month so as we are approaching the conclusions in the parliament and the council we, we kind of can see right now the, the conflict lines, the alliances, the attacks on the Commission's proposal clearer and clearer. And while these um, lines become clearer, I would really like to maybe single out some elements that I think need to be improved by the uh, in the position's proposal. Um, and also those aspects that need to be defended, protected, which are based in the Commission's proposal. So when it comes about improving the Commission's proposal, I think we should include more ecosystem and going beyond the protection of forests only. We should include internationally recognized land, indigenous and labor rights, and not only those who are applicable in the country of production as the Commission is right now doing. We need to cover more commodities and products, um, like, for example, maize, rubber and more wood products who actually have been also part of the study of the impact assessment the commission drafted but as commissioner told us were left out for political reasons so we need to discuss them um, also we need due diligence for finance institutes or at least some kind of revision that wants to look at the problem and we need civil liability for companies to to assume responsibility responsibility for damages and for victims to get access to justice and to get compensation. But I think what is very crucial and what especially progressive forces have to force on is to protect the basis elements that the Commission came up with, because if we fail to defend and protect the basis and the main mechanisms of the regulation, for example, the definitions of deforestation and forest degradation and the due diligence system, the, this whole instrument wouldn't work. So I think this is very, very important. And maybe to give an overview, what is under attack 
within the Commission proposal. It's it's on the one hand that forest rich member states and conservatives are really trying to water down definitions of deforestation and especially of forest degradation. Um, I am convinced that we cannot afford a weakened definition just for the sake of the concept included in the regulation, because covering degradation of forests will be very key to this proposal as it is a huge problem also, also within the EU that needs to be, be tackled as it has really, really negative implications for biodiversity and climate on itself. Um, so what is also very important to, to defend is the due diligence approach, which is really in the heart of the proposal and we in the parliament fought very hard for this to be the case. Um, so it's operators and traders and not 30 party certification schemes or consumers that shall carry the responsibility for deforestation free products in the EU. This is the core of it. So therefore we need to avert attempts to weaken the geolocalization requirements, stick to the requirements of strict traceability to the plot of land. We have to put big traders at the same footing as operators when, uh, when it comes to their responsibilities. And we need to make sure that certification schemes are not becoming something like a green lane that liberates companies from their due diligence obligations. So these are just maybe the overviews because I only have five minutes and I just can touch upon the main issues, but I bet we will discuss this um, later when we discuss. So this would be my first start. Thank you very much, Alaria. Absolutely, we're going to dig into all of those issues that you raised there in much more detail throughout the event. So thank you for those introductory remarks. Um, I'd like, now like to kick off the first uh, panel session of today's events on uh, due diligence. So how does it work? What are the obligations for companies? Everything you just spoke about there, Delara. Um, so a quick reminder before we get stuck into the session to keep your questions coming in throughout uh, at these sessions. And you can do that via the Q&A function as I explained at the beginning of the event. So let me just see if, uh, if Bojan is connected. I know he was having a few connection problems. I can't see him on my screen. Uh, I think we might have to skip to the next speaker and come back to him. Um, okay, in which case I'd like to firstly welcome uh, to the floor um, Andrea Carter from uh, from Greenpeace to talk about some of the concerns related to the proposal um, as they stand. So Andrea, if I could pass the floor to you, sorry for calling you up early and we'll come back to, to Bojan afterwards. So hopefully you're happy to jump in. Thank you very much, Andrea. You're ready, no problem. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for the invitation. I hope you are hearing me well. Good. Yes, we hear you so, perfectly. Let's, let's get to business. I will also like start the, start the timer so that I know that I, stay on time. The due diligence, that's like the core of the proposal. And uh, we need to be clear of what kind of due diligence we are talking about, because not all due diligence processes are the same. Here we have a product due diligence that is a mechanism whereby operators and traders make sure that what they put on the market for the first time, make available or export is in line with EU law requirement. So it's not like a process to improve company operations or otherwise save the world, be more sustainable. No, it is something, it is a process to make sure that commodities and products are in line with what EU law requires. For this, for this purpose, the, the due diligence here is a, a three-step mechanism. Well, it, it's, it's lo it follows as a logical consequence that when one wants to know if the product is fine, they have to know exactly where it comes from, the plot of land traceability requirement. They have to assess risks in like related to the plot of land. Uh, was the plot of land deforested? Is it like a plot of land where, where forest degradation occurred? Is it a plot of land that is subject to disputes between indigenous people and commodity extractors or traders? Well, there is a risk. Is there a risk of contamination in the supply chain where a known compliant product may be joined to a compliant product and then placed on the market? Well, these risks must be identified and assessed. 
Is it possible to mitigate the risk? There comes the, the third step, that is the risk mitigation element. Uh, can we do something if there is a risk of contamination of supply chain? Well, we will set up a process so that the supply chain is perfectly segregated and the risk of contamination is minimal, for instance. That could be like a way to, to mitigate risks. Or is there a risk that indigenous people's rights may be violated? Well, mitigation procedure, go make contact, talk to the, 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 the indigenous groups that are interested or to the local community, see if they have launched claim, see if there is any case pending and so on and forth. Listen to NGOs that are operating in, in the, in the on the ground and see what they are doing and if there are problems. So three steps, know where the things come from, information requirement, see if there are any risk, risk assessment, mitigate the risk, risk mitigation. At the end of this equation, there has to be one possible result and that is the risks must not be more than negligible. That is, you like the not operator must not have any second thought about the possible infringement of the EU law requirement. If the risks are more than negligible, that is like there is something that has been left unchecked or that it or, or which the, the operator is not sure, but then the answer is no placing on the market. So it is a very, it is a very binary, very simple if you want, like structured mechanism. There is no continuous improvement. There is no obligation for an operator to set in motion things to, to um, say, uh, improve the situation. That says, we see that coming under attack because there are many attempts to uh, create exemptions for SMEs, create exemptions from, for small traders, uh, exclude uh, certain areas from, uh, from um, uh, let's say, like the notion of de deforestation, enhance the role of certification, which should be only a complementary information. Um, let's say, and expand the role of BPAs, that, of VPA licenses that are there to certify legality, but not sustainability. Um, and also like a misuse of the, or, or, or a strange uh, redefinition of the country benchmarking that would remove high risk countries and regions. And here I'm done. Uh, so that basically more countries would be qualified as low risk and not undergo the, the due diligence. Now we think that uh, not only the, the, the structure of the due diligence procedure should be preserved at all costs, but also that if anything, like it is the, the low risk category in the country benchmarking that should be removed because at, at present there is no country that can say and can be said to be at, at low risk unless really it has no forest and it is not producing the, 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 the commodities uh, uh, the commodities at, at stake. We know that the, the, there is an attempt within the EU from, from like a number of, of forest rich countries to water down the, the, the legislation. And one of the, the ideas is that they would all classify as, 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 as low risk, but we need to avoid that uh, to maintain, let's say like the good functioning of the structure. I will, stay here so that I, I stay on time and possibly I can answer, I can take questions later. Excellent. Thank, Thank you so very much. much. And Thank you very much for that, Andrea. And yes, just as you uh, said, there will be time uh, for questions later on in the event. So don't go anywhere and you can put your questions to Andrea in the Q and A uh, function at the bottom of your screen. Um, so I'm just going to have a last minute check to see if we have the commission representative with us. I know that he's trying to join from his computer. I believe he has not yet not yet managed to connect. That's not the end of the world, that's okay. We will move uh, to the next session and then we'll come back um, to, to hear from the Commission representative a little bit later on in the event. So let me kick off uh, the second. Is he just joined? Is it just in the nick of time? Let me have a look. 
Uh, Bojan, are, are you with us? I can, I see him. I can't hear you, I'm afraid. Let me give a quick introduction just while he's trying to uh, connect there. So um, Bojan Grilas is from the European Commission's Directorate General for the Environment. He's here to talk about uh, the Commission's perspective and their ambitions for this file. So Bojan, I'm very much hoping, are you able to uh, unmute? You seem to be muted. <laughs> What's a webinar without some technical hiccups? <laughs> oh, I hear some sound from you, Bojan. Hello, are you connected? Can you hear me now? Yes, I hear you. I think we're good. Thank you, you very fun. much. And uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very sorry. Uh, we did have quite some technical problems on this side today, uh, but very glad to be in the call. I'm also very sorry that I missed the first part. Of, of the event. I would like to first of all thanks to the thank to the organizers for organizing this um, a very important and interesting event in the in uh, in a very in very important moment and then to um, to focus on a couple of main messages on our side on on the deforestation initiative. Maybe just to say that uh, and I will focus on very specific elements. Um, you know, uh, everybody I believe by now knows that the main uh, crucial elements of the proposal of the Commission proposal are due diligence and also the benchmarking system. And in this occasion, I would like to mention that uh, as regards due diligence uh, in this relatively advanced stage at this point of the uh, talks, also in our context with many, many stakeholders, we have noticed that uh, there are some um, elements that come up very often and that make us a little bit worried. So first of all, I would like to say that um, our, based on our experience also in EU timber regulation, it is clear that uh, the, it is absolutely necessary to have a strict traceability because if there's no strict traceability, if there are any exceptions, any, any um, let's say undefined territory in the system, then it simply doesn't work. Uh, secondly, um, it is very important to keep the benchmarking because the benchmarking is uh, an element that improves, uh, we could say it like that, uh, the due diligence in itself. We have seen in the EU timber regulation that um, many, many times the competent authorities, but also the industry has called, uh, have, uh, have been mentioning, oh, but it would be great to have something similar to uh, what is there in the IOU fishing regulation, and this is exactly what we built on. So this is really a call from the colleagues working uh, on the industry side and also in the, on the authority side. To be a little bit more precise on the elements that are really crucial and um, uh, that uh, would be, in terms of then successful implementation later, uh, absolutely important to keep. First of all, we need to keep the plot of land. Uh, it could be called in a different way, that's not an issue. However, we need to be precise about that. If there is less precision, that would not be a problem only for the competent authorities and, and for, for performing checks. It would actually be a problem for the industry. You could imagine that if there was a bigger area not uh, well defined, uh, actually the company sourcing from them could be in a problem because uh, they could always be um, let's say in a position to having to prove that in the whole big territory there's no deforestation while they want to be present, uh, seen by now in the, um, in the last couple of months that um, very often uh, there is the issue of smallholders that, it, that is put on uh, in front as a potential problem uh, for smallholders to actually be compliant and maybe they would be then kept out of the supply chain. But what we see is that the smallholders themselves from several third countries, including Indonesia, Cote d'Ivoire and others are calling for strict due diligence, not for watering it down. Why? Because they see this uh, as um, increasing transparency and as their own chance to actually have the level playing field and uh, more just access to the supply chain. So using the pretext of smallholders to try to water down some of the elements of the regulation is not the way to go. We really see that as a pretext because on the other hand, there are clear messages from the smallholders to keep up the strict traceability. On due diligence is such very, another very important uh, element to bear in mind and that we need to keep is that um, we need to avoid having any exceptions or specific situ special situations. Why? One of the clearest lessons learned and most important ones from the EU 
system regulation is that due diligence works as long as the burden of proof is on the operators. And that's exactly how it was in EU timber regulation. And in that sense, it's very similar here. As you probably know, we have included in the commission proposal a number of additional elements to have the system even better, learning from the lessons learned from EU timber regulation. But the crucial element is to keep the burden of proof on the operators. What does that mean? If there is an exception, if there was an exception, and we do not want to have exceptions exactly for this reason, then the competent authority would need to prove, not only in those cases, but also all other cases, that the shipment in question is not coming from an exceptional uh, area or area covered by a certain exception. That would imply having the burden of proof on the authorities, not the operators. We know that in EUTR, whenever, for different reasons, very different reasons, the burden of proof has ended up being on the authorities, it didn't work. The whole system crumbles and it simply doesn't work. It's too complicated. It's simply in the, in the legal systems of the national countries, of the member states, sorry, it doesn't work when the burden of proof is on the authorities. And, uh, and that's not, not how due diligence, at least in this context, is supposed to work. So that's something to bear in mind in terms of avoiding any kind of exceptions or, or special situations. Uh, one other thing to mention is that lesson learned, clear lesson learned from EU team regulation is that we do need to have stronger elements within the regulation itself as regards um, the calls and the attempt to have a more harmonized approach across the whole EU. And one of the single most important elements in this uh, sense is the percentages that we included of checks for standard and uh, high risk countries. Um, they are now on 5 and 15%, but this is extremely important to bear in mind that um, it was actually a call from a number of member states that have been applying EUTR very successfully to try to get also all the member states to a certain degree of um, checks uh, and harmonized approach in order to avoid also possible trade shifts and then, of course, problems with the industry, because if in one member states they are checked much more than in another, that obviously represents a problem from many points of view. That is why we have the percentages in the Commission proposal, percentages of checks, and it would be extremely important that they are kept. One other element that I want to mention, also building on the EUTR experience, is that we do need to cover the non-SME traders uh, in a different way than in EUTR. Why? Because in the timber regulation, we have been faced, the competent authorities and member states and the commission with uh, numerous situations where bigger companies have actually been dealing with um, illegal timber or products coming from illegally harvested timber. But they would simply say, we don't have anything to do with it because we are not the operators. And if in some cases, operators were actually fictitious companies set up just to shield these kind of traders, and then they would disappear when the competent authorities would start investigations and something else would pop up. Actually, the authorities and the commission would hit the wall and we were not able to do anything about it because the regulation simply didn't cover it. It is absolutely imperative that in this regulation, we do cover um, non-SME traders in a way that um, leaves the that opens the possibility to the authorities and to the commission to deal with these kind of situations. Maybe before, before I end, I would like to say that uh, as you have seen in our proposal, we do recognize the potential uh, role for certification, but as also very visible from our study on certification published a couple of months back, uh, there is clear uh, evidence and experience in EU timber regulation that while the certification, different certification schemes can help to a certain degree to, uh, to comply with the due diligence requirements, it can certainly not be a green lane. On the one hand, it would then be a problem of the uh, burden of proof and responsibility that has to be on operators in order for the system to work. On the other hand, we did detect with the, with the uh, competent authorities numerous issues in application of uh, even the best certification systems, both within the EU and outside. Um, I did mention before that the second element, second crucial element of the proposal, and that's the benchmarking. And there, um, it is crucial to bear in mind that the new element of the high risk, uh, the category of high risk countries is actually crucial for the whole proposal. Why? Because on the one hand, it increases the uh, clarity and information for the industry and for the competent authorities. As I said, we have been hearing numerous calls from both uh, in EUTR um, saying it would have been much easier and better and 
uh, better in terms of costs if we had something like that in EU timber regulation. On the other hand, uh, it is a crucial tool for cooperation and developments uh, abroad, outside of the EU. Why? Because if there was a country or area that was in the risk of uh, becoming uh, uh, high risk or of entering the high risk category, that will be a huge clear signal to the EU, to the Commission and the Member States that that's the area where the cooperation and development has to focus. And we do know that with cooperation and developments, we have a num numerous, um, let's say, things to bear in mind. One of them is that the, the resources are limited. And we have learned from FLEC that sometimes these resources, some of the important countries were not covered. Others, maybe interesting or relevant countries, yes, but maybe the prioritization could have been better. In this sense, the high-risk category offers a great new tool for better focus and more efficient use of resources. On the other hand, the low risk category is important uh, because of the lessons learned in EUTR, where, for example, with uh, countries such as uh, Switzerland and Norway, in the enormous majority of cases, there was uh, no need to have the same due diligence uh, as, for example, for the imports coming from Myanmar. So that's also um, how we, um, the Commission uh, sees the way out in terms of lowering the costs and making sure that both the industry and the authorities focus on those areas which are really a problem and the objective of this regulation to be dealt with. One more thing about the benchmarking. Very important to bear in mind that there is no ban. I will. I will. Uh, I understand. I took a bit more time, but it's it's very important to to understand that for the benchmarking there is no ban, and uh, in terms of high risk countries, uh, nothing uh, would change there in terms of due diligence. It's the same level of due diligence as for the standard. The changes in the percentage of costs. So um, in this sense, uh, the high risk countries are uh, the areas where there is the potential of deforestation and it is the areas these are the areas uh, very much closely related with the objective of of the regulation the goal is not to have a lot of countries at, as the high risk that would mean that we all fail it's on the contrary not to have any area of country there but already with the possibility of flagging that some area might go towards high risk that is where we immediately need to start working even more with the area in question through cooperation and development to avoid having that as high risk. That is the objective. Thank you very much and sorry for having taken a bit more time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bojan. I'm very glad that you managed to join because you had a lot of interesting things to say there. And uh, yeah, as I, as I mentioned before, do keep your questions coming in. Bojan will be staying with us uh, to answer your questions. So let's go straight uh, into the second panel session today, uh, which will focus on traceability. Why is it essential? How feasible is it in practice? Um, and to help us explore this in, in, in more detail, I'd like to firstly welcome to the floor Michael Rice from Client Earth to introduce this topic and what is needed for it to be effective. So Michael, the floor is yours. You're right, thank you, Natasha. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Michael uh, and I lead Client Earth's work on the proposed EU deforestation free products regulation. Uh, it's my pleasure to contribute to this event and thank you to MEP Toussaint and your staff for the invitation. Um, I mean, one of the elements which has received quite a lot of uh, critical attention, I think from industry stakeholders is the proposal for a supply chain traceability requirement. Um, it's not a very accessible topic, uh, the relevant provisions of the proposed regulation and their implications in practice can be rather technical, uh, not easy to explain in a few minutes. Um, and on top of that, um, there are wildly diverging statements uh, by some very major industry stakeholders about the feasibility and the necessity of traceability, you know, raising a range of concerns while sometimes also claiming at the same time that their supply chain already deforestation free. Um, so we tried to address some of the contradictions in a briefing we published just 10 days ago, uh, in which we provide a detailed explanation of the proposed traceability requirements, why they are important, and address some of the main concerns of industry stakeholders, uh, which you can also find on our website. I'm not going to try and summarize uh, that briefing now. Uh, there's quite a lot in it. Um, but instead, I want to make just three basic points about the merits of supply chain traceability with the help of a murder mystery analogy. So imagine you're a detective 
and you've been asked to solve an international crime as fast as you can, but you're not told where it happened. It's not a recent crime either. It happened a few years ago, two years, three years, five years, maybe even 10 years, you're not sure. There are no known witnesses, no suspects, no evidence. Then someone gives you a clue from the crime scene and they tell you the country that it came from, Brazil or Indonesia, or maybe Ghana. Maybe they even tell you the province, say the state of Pará in Brazil or West Kalimantan in Indonesia. But these are still vast geographies. They say that's what they were told by the person who gave the clue to them. Hmm, hearsay, you think, not reliable evidence. And that's all you know. How would you solve the case as fast as you can? Then you're told there's security camera footage of the crime scene at the time of the crime and every other crime like it committed around the entire world. And you can have it today for free. You could solve the crime with a few clicks on the internet if you only knew where it happened. So my first point is that the justification for supply chain traceability in a deforestation free products regulation is self-explanatory. It's the means to prove compliance. Without knowing where to look, operators cannot check whether their products are deforestation free and were produced legally in order to be able to place them on the EU market. And nor can they use the wealth of free and publicly available satellite imagery, previously the most expensive part of a deforestation monitoring system, because that information only becomes useful if you know where to look. And that's essentially what the proposed traceability requirements infer, that EU operators know where to look to check whether each shipment of covered products they intend to place on the market meet the proposed requirements. Uh, and this is my second point, shipments, not individual products. Uh, so contrary to some industry statements, there is no proposed obligations that operators must be able to identify the point of production for an individual soybean or cocoa pod or plank of wood or any other single product. Uh, which is an important distinction because due diligence conducted on a particular supply chain may cover multiple shipments received through that supply chain. And the submission of due diligence statements on a per shipment basis, which may well contain the same details for each shipment received through the same supply chain, provides a, quite a clever mechanism for national enforcement authorities to monitor the flow of covered products into their jurisdiction almost in real time. Uh, my third point is that existing examples of full supply chain traceability in every commodity sector listed in the commission's proposal, not only prove that it's feasible, but also indicate that implementation costs especially when done at scale, are small and gradually become negligible when compared to the financial flows linked to soft commodity trade. Uh, we know that most major commodity traders have already committed to achieving fully traceable and zero deforestation supply chains and traceability schemes in key producer countries are either already being implemented or are under development. Uh, however, progress has been quite slow. And uh, imagine the boost that a legal requirement would provide at the scale of the world's single largest market. Um, so our recent briefing expands on these points and addresses other arguments that you may have heard against the proposed traceability requirements. Um, I commend it to you. We can put the link in the chat and I'm happy to answer any questions if there's time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Michael. Um, I will now turn to our next speaker, and um, that is Christian Lelong, who is the director of natural resources at the French company Kairos. Uh, he will talk to you about the role of satellite imagery in helping to ensure traceability. So, Christian, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Natasha, and thanks for the opportunity to speak um, on this panel. 
Um, so I work at Kairos, we're a geospatial analytics firm, which means we work with satellite data and we develop algorithms to extract useful information, uh, particularly now on the environmental uh, area. And uh, one point I want to make is, you know, satellite uh, uh, analytics um, is really going to be a critical tool to stop imported deforestation. Uh, it's going to be a tool for operators to understand what's happening in their own supply chain and for competent authorities to verify that um, all the uh, shipments um, getting into the EU market are deforestation free. Um, there's two points I want to make, one on the technology side um, and then later about cost. So going a little bit over what uh, Michael just said. Um, on the technology front, the number of um, Earth observation satellites um, is constantly increasing, which means you know, we can see more and more things. And it's not just um, optical images to look at where deforestation has happened, but there are also radar satellites or multispectral satellites, microwave satellites. So we can also see what's happening under the canopy and automate a lot of the process of identifying, are we looking at a, at a, a maize field? Are we looking at pasture for grazing? Um, so a lot of that uh, analysis can be done with um, more accuracy uh, than, than before. And satellites, um, to you know, follow up with the analogy of the security cameras, um, satellites are great for three reasons. One, they give you a lot of history. We can go back five years, sometimes 10 years, 15 years, uh, and see what happened then. Two, it's the transparency argument. Um, most of the time we're working with government satellites, which means everyone has access to it academia, NGOs, private companies, we're all working with the same raw data. And three, uh, satellites have a lot of uh, frequent measurements, they have global coverage, so you really have uh, a great data set to work with. And to give you a quick example of what that looks like, um, let's go to uh, Mato Grosso in Brazil, uh, where there is a lot of uh, soybean uh, and, uh, and cattle. Um, so this is an example of a live platform um, that uh, shows how um, this type of, uh, of mapping can work. So what we've done here is we've selected um, an area and we've identified uh, all the parcels that have been uh, deforested. If it's in red, it means it's now agriculture, so it's going to be soybean. If it's pale green, it means it's barren, which means it hasn't been planted yet, or it's been used for, for grazing. And the year um, that you see um, is the year in which the deforestation occurred. And then on top of that, what we've done is we've, you know, using public data sources, we identified the closest silos um, uh, or collection points for soybean. So in this case, the closest one is called Amazon Mafini. The second closest one is uh, called Fenag uh, Feliz Natal. So this is an example of how you can start to build these, um, you know, the whole information on the deforestation that occurred, the commodity concern, and the entry point into the supply chain that then would go all the way to the loading terminal on the Brazilian coast. So the second point about costs, um, again, as Mike said, they are quite low. The satellite data itself, most of the time it's free. So users are only paying really for the, the mapping, uh, the, the geolocation of you know, what is where and the algorithms to automate all of that. Um, keeping in mind that um, a lot of the operators uh, have you know, quite a bit of scale. Uh, the 10 largest exporting countries of these uh, FERC commodities have annual exports uh, in aggregate of about 30 billion euro, which means annual turnover for many of these players is going to be measured in hundreds of millions of euro. And the cost of implementing this type of satellite-based system is going to be somewhere around, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.5% of turnover. So it's definitely not a, a, a big impact um, on their bottom line. And very important to specify that the growers, especially the small growers, are not affected by this. They don't need to use this system. The, their only role is to provide 
coordinates to, to help with the mapping um, of the supply chain. So they're not impacted at all. So that's why you know we think uh, remote sensing has a big role to play. Um, and we've seen something similar in a slightly related matter, uh, which is the topic of imported emissions, uh, where again, satellites uh, are already playing a big role in supporting the, uh, uh, the policies of the, of the commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. And now, last but not least, I will turn to Traoré uh, Bakary, who is director of IDEF, which is an NGO from the Ivory Coast. Uh, he'll talk a little bit about the perspective of smallholders. I understand that he will speak in French with some translation. Um, so uh, I will pass the floor over to you, Traoré. Uh, sorry, you're you're on mute. I think you're muted. I can't hear you anyway. Are you able to unmute yourself? There we go. Voilà. Donc, voilà. Euh, yeah. Bonjour à tous. Uh, je vais essayer de parler doucement parce qu'il y a la traduction derrière. Uh, donc, uh, je suis Traoré Bakari. Je travaille pour uh, une ONG qui s'appelle IDF. Uh, nous sommes spécialisés en fait dans la gouvernance des ressources naturelles et le suivi des chaînes d'approvisionnement durable. Euh, donc, on publie pas mal de rapports. On a déjà publié plusieurs rapports sur le secteur forêt. Et là, on publie aussi des rapports sur euh, le secteur cacao. Et le dernier rapport qu'on a publié, c'est les lacunes euh, de, la, euh, de la filière cacao en Côte d'Ivoire. Et ce rapport, il est disponible. À, à Charlotte pourra vous le partager après. Euh, dans cette discussion, donc, je voulais vraiment remercier Madame la députée Marie Toussaint pour cette initiative. C'est super important qu'on puisse exprimer notre point de vue à ce genre de rencontre. Euh, donc, moi, je vais aborder trois points principaux. Le premier point, c'est sur euh, la géolocalisation. Et comme certains le savent ici, IDF, euh, dans le cadre de notre consortium qu'on a mis en place pour participer au dialogue politique Union européenne-Côte d'Ivoire sur le cacao durable, on a rédigé une lettre au mois de février pour euh, comment dit, argumenter en faveur de la géolocalisation qui se trouve déjà dans le draft des textes de l'Union européenne qui a été publié en novembre dernier. Et pourquoi nous, on est engagés sur ce sujet euh, Je vais vous mettre juste un, un slide pour vous expliquer pourquoi c'est super important pour nous de, de parler des géolocalisations. Je ne sais pas si vous voyez mon écran. Euh, alors, pourquoi la géolocalisation, c'est super important pour nous Attends, j'ai une slide en, en anglais. Ça sera beaucoup plus mieux pour vous. Euh, en anglais, les slides en anglais, voilà. Là, c'est mieux. Et la géolocalisation, c'est mieux pour nous. Vous regardez, on a deux schémas. Et vous voyez le schéma au milieu, en tout cas le premier schéma. Vous voyez la structure actuelle de la traçabilité. C'est super complexe. Et ça, c'est juste un, un type de structure, un, un, un couloir. Mais il y a plusieurs autres couloirs avec plusieurs autres acteurs. Et ça, parce qu'on est dans un système où, effectivement, on, en général, on ne sait pas où quitte le cacao, où ça va et quel acteur ça doit passer, etc. Et nous, pourquoi on est... Et ça, ça a un impact sur les petits producteurs, parce qu'à chaque fois qu'il y a un intermédiaire, il y a une diminution de ce qui doit arriver aux petits producteurs. Chaque fois qu'il y a un intermédiaire, ça diminue le, euh, ce qui doit arriver aux petits producteurs. Jusqu'à la fin, ils se retrouvent avec des misères. Donc, vous, quand vous achetez une barre chocolatée en Europe, chère, en pensant que vous achetez pour la bonne cause et que ça va bénéficier à des petits producteurs, en général, ça va dans les poches d'autres personnes qui ne savent même pas à quoi ressemble une box de cacao. Donc, euh, c'est pourquoi nous, on fait la géolocalisation avec 34, autres 000, euh, 34 000 producteurs. On a fait cette lettre pour dire que la géolocalisation, ça va permettre de simplifier le circuit et surtout, ça va avoir un seul intermédiaire dans le système, c'est-à-dire la coopérative vers les exportateurs. Donc, voilà pourquoi on est vraiment engagé sur euh, la défense de la géolocalisation dans le système de traçabilité. Euh, donc, cela m'amène à toucher le deuxième point euh, de, 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 mon, de mon intervention, c'est la question de la transition. Euh, Aujourd'hui, tout le monde a compris en Côte d'Ivoire qu'on n'a plus de forêt et que le cacao ne marche que là où se trouve la forêt. Donc, tout le monde est d'accord, en fait, pour dire que le cacao a fait de la déforestation. Mais s'il n'y a pas de forêt, il n'y a pas de cacao. Tout le monde est d'accord là-dessus. Mais aujourd'hui, les producteurs, les petits producteurs ne peuvent pas, euh, comment dire, investir dans cette transition pour créer de la forêt, pour enrichir les sols, parce qu'ils ont utilisé pendant longtemps des pesticides pour appauvrir les sols. Ils ont abattu les arbres, etc. 
Aujourd'hui, ils ont pris conscience, mais ils n'ont pas les moyens d'investir dans cette transition. Donc, c'est vraiment important qu'on puisse réfléchir à comment on va appuyer les petits producteurs pour, euh, comment dire, enrichir les sols, faire du reboisement massif, donc euh, planter des arbres, etc. Ça a déjà commencé avec l'appui de quelques partenaires, des ONG, etc. Je vois qu'il y a des gens des clientes ici. Clientes soutient depuis 2020 une initiative d'IDF pour faire de l'agroforesterie avec les, produits, les petits producteurs à l'ouest de la Côte d'Ivoire et puis un peu au centre. Ces genres d'initiatives, ça, ça permet en fait de recréer les conditions propices à la production de l'agriculture. Euh, mon troisième point, c'est sur le système des benchmarks. Et alors, ça, c'est super important dans, le, dans la logique où euh, la Côte d'Ivoire, pour ceux qui connaissent un peu l'Afrique de l'Ouest, etc., on a à l'est de la Côte d'Ivoire le Ghana, qui est le deuxième pays producteur de cacao. Et puis, on a à l'ouest de la Côte d'Ivoire le Libéria, qui est un des pays les plus forestiers d'Afrique. Il y a beaucoup de forêts au Libéria. Alors, que si dans le système des benchmark, comme c'est prévu, on fait des classements haut risque, risque standard et risque faible, on, on, imaginons un cas de figure où la Côte d'Ivoire est classée haut risque et donc le cacao avec beaucoup, beaucoup de paperasse qui va être demandé aux, aux, aux exportateurs. Bah, c'est très facile, surtout qu'on est dans la CDAO, qui est un espace économique comme Schengen, donc libre circulation des personnes et des biens. Et quelqu'un pourrait aller au Ghana assez facilement en traversant la frontière parce que si le Ghana est un pays à risque intermédiaire ou faible, pour faire passer son cacao là-bas pour vendre. Donc, le système de benchmark, non seulement ça doit rester à l'échelle nationale, mais il faut qu'on commence à réfléchir pour voir, est-ce qu'on ne va pas le traiter à l'échelle transnationale pour ces jeunes cas C'est une réflexion que nous, on met sur la table pour essayer de se donner les moyens de lutter contre les fuites de cacao qui peuvent avoir des pardons de frontières, pour ne pas que quelqu'un saute d'un pays à l'autre, juste parce que les risques sont faibles là-bas et qu'il aura moins de papiers à présenter aux autorités compétentes des lieux. Donc, le système des benchmarks, j'ai entendu dire qu'il y avait une réflexion sur le fait de le régionaliser à l'intérieur du pays. Ça, ce serait une grosse erreur parce que, comme je vous l'ai dit, déjà les frontières externes, c'est facile à traverser. Si c'est à l'intérieur du même pays, entre les régions, là, c'est la porte ouverte à, à, à toutes les possibilités de fraude. Et je termine donc mon point sur le partenariat qui est euh, dans, le, dans le texte, qui est vraiment important. Maintenant, euh, moi, j ai, j ai, je le dis toujours, les grandes réformes qu'on a eues en Côte d'Ivoire depuis 2012, en Côte d'Ivoire sur le secteur forêt, sont, ces réformes-là ont été initiées grâce aux négociations APV FLECT. C'est-à-dire que depuis 2012, la Côte d'Ivoire est engagée avec l'Union européenne dans les négociations APV FLECT pour lutter contre la production illégale du bois. Et dans le cadre de cette négociation, la Côte d'Ivoire a fait beaucoup, beaucoup de réformes en, en faveur du secteur forestier pour la transparence, l'accès à l'information, etc. Aujourd'hui, le secteur cacao se caractérise par son opacité. Personne n'est au courant de ce qui se passe, etc. Donc, nous, on pense que les discussions avec l'Union européenne pour le dialogue politique sur le cacao durable, avec euh, le règlement en cours d'élaboration, c'est une opportunité pour... Euh, exiger en fait des réformes profondes dans la filière cacao pour permettre à ce qu'en fait il y ait moins d'opacité dans ce secteur, que tout le monde ait accès aux au, au documents. Donc, dans le cadre de ce partenariat, l'UE pourrait vraiment jouer un rôle important en matière de faire un peu de pression pour faire euh, des réformes importantes, pour faire en sorte qu'on puisse avoir un secteur forestier transparent, mais surtout un secteur forestier où euh, les, le cadre réglementaire est tellement clair que les acteurs ne peuvent pas se cacher derrière euh, des, des, des failles juridiques pour faire des choses. Donc, voilà un peu ce que je voulais partager avec vous ce matin et merci encore pour l'invitation. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. I'll sorry. just introduce you quickly. I'll just to say that um, we'll have a quick translation of what we've just heard into English. Um, so, Charlotte, I'll just pass the floor over to you to, to hear. Yeah, th thank you very much, Bakari, for uh, for coming here and expressing all these uh, issues for smallholders in Ivory Coast. So, we'll try to translate briefly uh, what you've said. So, um, uh, Bakari is coming from an NGO in Ivory Coast called IDEF and works a lot with smallholders on the cocoa sector. Um, and for him and for the, 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 the NGO networks and the smallholders networks with who they are working and we're going to share a report and a letter uh, just after the webinar to express more in details the position. But it's really important to maintain 
uh, all the requirement of geolocation in the traceability system, because it's only that that allows uh, to answer all the complexity of the supply chain. Indeed, um, producer are really in favor of um, a production of cocoa without any deforestation because cocoa completely depends on the forest to exist and to be developed. So without forest, there is no cocoa. However, um, a lot of smallholders do not have the resources to implement this transition. And um, so there is a link with the partnership too because most of the important reforms in the forestry sectors over the last uh, 10 years have been achieved thanks to negotiation between Ivory Coast and the EU, mainly through flagged VPAs. So um, this reform, this process of reform and dialogue between Ivory Coast and EU on sustainable cocoa is an opportunity to be like demanding in terms of reform uh, in the cocoa sectors. This is a sector that really need transparency to be improved. Um, so this, um, this partnership are really important. Um, on the benchmarking system, um, it's a really important system also for uh, the NGO and the smallholders in Ivory Coast. Um, it's really important to make sure that it stays at national scale and not lower scale. Um, and even maybe can evolve um, through a transnational way, because for instance, the border between Ivory Coast and Ghana, they are really easy to cross. Um, so, so yeah, we need to have a country benchmarking that is strong at national level and maybe later on at international level. Um, and what is said too is that the uh, geolocation uh, mechanism for the traceability um, is feasible and already done by a lot of smallholders uh, through uh, their the tools that they have, um, and it's it's, an, it's really necessary to help them achieve having um, resources and um, product that are um, uh, easy to export with um, with fair trades and um, and good to post the producer too. Uh, it's a little bit speed, but um, the letter and the report are available in English and will be sent just after the webinar to all the people registered here. So you will be able to look at in details uh, to what has been said. Merci encore beaucoup, uh, Bakary. Thank you very much for that um, that quick summary. And yes, I'll just reiterate that you will be able to see the letter afterwards. Um, I would just ask um, uh, Traoui, I think we are still seeing your screen. Perhaps you could stop uh, sharing your screen so that we could see um, the other participants. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, so before we move to this short Q&A session, um, I would now like to pass the floor to Green MEP uh, Marie Toussaint for her reaction to what we have heard so far. So Marie, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot. And sorry then for the question time, because in the Delara and I have meetings just after. Um, I thank all of our uh, participants and especially for thanking me uh, to organize this meeting. I have to say that I have some great person working with me, Charlotte, who is hidden here, Charlotte Isa, but she is the one coordinating everything. So I want to thank her especially, and of course, Delara as well um, for being here and working together. Um, all of your inputs are of utmost importance uh, for us. And especially, uh, Delaha said, we're in the middle of the negotiations, we're still one month left, um, but we also have a trilogue tomorrow on very hot uh, issues that we were able to address today. For instance, the rich benchmarking country, um, the extension to other ecosystems or not, um, the, the issuers of certification or the partnership um, with uh, third countries. And there I look at uh, Bakari uh, on this issue uh, of very utmost importance. Um, and all of your studies uh, and input, yes, a trilogue, yes, whatever, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, all of your inputs, um, as I said, is really important, especially since we don't consider that um, the proposal from the commission right now is well-defined. And there I look at, at Boyan, of course, um, because we see that there are some holes um, in the record that we need to, we really need to address. Um, but from what we heard today also, we see that there is a lot of NGOs, but also industries and countries 
that are strongly asking for a strong uh, mechanism uh, for uh, due diligence in deforestation. So that's where we have to head right now and fighting also against the forest rich countries, but also the lobbies that want to weaken what's already on the table and want to prevent uh, it from being um, bettered by the European Parliament. So we will definitely work on the on that in that direction. Um, and the last issue that I wanted to raise because it's really important for me is that we need to also address um, environmental crime that is behind of this. Why, why is that? It's because we see and we have a due diligence forest um, due diligence case going on in France right now with Casino, with a distributor of food. Um, and what we see is that, um, that the, the meat that they import um, and use is coming from areas where we have a lot of um, violations of human rights um, and of uh, environmental crimes in Colombia and in Brazil. And what we see, and it's also why we need um, those uh, numeric uh, system uh, to survey um, the forest. What we see is that um, sometimes governments don't answer to the rules, the even rules that they have adopted. And what was in Brazil, for instance, and I invite you all to watch the, the documentary, The Territory. What we see in Brazil right now is that we have invasions of um, indigenous territories. And when the indigenous or the NGOs call on to the government, there is no one answering. So the land is being de deforested. Some people are being killed or at least arrested. Um, and that's also why we need such a strong regulation. It's also to protect um, the people and to fight against the crimes that are committed sometimes with the implicit agreement of the governments. So I want to thank you a lot again. I don't know if you are going to open a question and answer um, session, but I have to leave. But thanks a lot um, for the discussion today, but more especially for all the work that lies behind. And it's huge, um, but it's in favor of the protection of the planet and the people. So it's really, really valuable. So thanks a lot to everyone again. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, yeah, it's a shame you have to leave us, but I know you have to run off. So thank you very much for those uh, for your reaction there. Um, so yeah, let's kick off the, the short Q&A session. We have about 10, 10, 15 minutes, something like that. Um, I'd like to firstly turn to uh, Bojan for a question. Perhaps firstly, I could hear your reaction to the traceability part, um, what we have just heard these last three panelists. Bojan, perhaps your thoughts on that. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, just to say thanks to all the panelists for uh, extremely interesting presentations. Um, well, I can actually be quite uh, short in terms of the, the question. Um, we argue and based on the information that we have, not only from our impact assessment, but also other studies and uh, ongoing work is that, um, as I mentioned, uh, the strict traceability is crucial. And it is not only crucial, but it, it is also very much possible and with a rather low cost. So the, the technology that maybe was not there 10 or 15 years ago, or now it's there, and it's actually available to basically almost everybody. Uh, this means that uh, in to be, let's say to simplify with, uh, with a simple uh, smartphone, uh, it is possible to actually uh, work to have the information that we deem to be crucial in terms of strict traceability. So, uh, in short, um, we we believe that what we heard in these presentations also um, uh, coincides with uh, with that view and uh, reconfirms that it's not only necessary but it's uh, very much uh, possible uh, with uh, simple technologies that are available uh, basically to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Christian, perhaps I'll turn to you now. You spoke um, a bit already about kind of small holders and who would pay, you know, the satellite, uh, the data at what cost? Perhaps you could just expand a little bit on that. You know, who would be paying for this? What, maybe you could address these concerns that people raise often um, about this issue. Sure. So the way we see this working is, you know, it's the companies that are exporting from say Brazil or Indonesia or Ivory Coast um, that need to have this information and ensure that all the products that they are loading on the ship and sending to Europe are free from deforestation and forest degradation. So they need that system. Um, but it doesn't mean that every intermediary, all the way back to the grower, 
needs to also have that system. And if you're a grower, you don't need satellite data to know if um, there was deforestation on your plots or not. So that's why we say that um, it doesn't really concern the, the small growers for sure. Uh, it probably doesn't concern most of the um, intermediaries. Um, and it's only the, the large exporters and of course the importers um, who would be required to use systems like this. Um, and based on uh, you know, what we were saying about the cost of satellite data, which has fallen a lot and in many cases it's free, uh, um, it's a very small share of the relative to their annual turnover. Okay, thank you for that. And, and sticking on, on the theme of kind of smallholders and um, small producers, I'll turn to uh, Michael, perhaps I'll turn to you now. Um, there is sometimes a concern there's too much focus on the environment compared to smallholders. You know, what would you maybe say to that, that criticism? Um, well, I think there's, I mean, the, I think con concerns about, you know, the potential negative impacts on smallholder producers, um, I mean, that's really limited to the cocoa and, and palm oil sectors. Um, so, for example, in, in West Africa, I think smallholders produce upwards of 90% of cocoa in, in Indonesia. We've seen some statistics saying it's around 34% of um, palm fruits are produced by smallholders. Often they're the most vulnerable players in these sectors. Um, so I think the concerns that there may be some unintended negative impacts on these very vulnerable family farmers is a, is a concern that needs to be taken seriously. Um, at the same time, we've also seen, I mean, the, the letter which EDEF has been involved in, which I think brought together something like 34,000 cocoa smallholders, um, was very, very similar, had very similar messages to a public statement published by Indonesia's largest palm oil smallholders association representing I think upwards of 58,000 palm oil smallholders um, making the case that supply chain traceability is in the best interests of smallholders uh, as Christian mentioned that uh, and as Boyan mentioned there is no genuine technological barrier for example the um, SPKS the, the palm oil smallholders association is helping their members you know, gather the geolocation information of their small holdings using smartphone technology. Um, so not only is, it, is there's, there's no real genuine technical barrier, but they see it as a huge opportunity to improve their position in the marketplace, you know, improve their visibility and their agency within the supply chain, but also, and perhaps more importantly, um, to imp improve their land security and their position to negotiate for broader sector reforms at the local or even at the national level um, by having more security about their, their tenure arrangements, about their, their small holdings, um, and having a stronger position to, of course, negotiate for a better price for their product. Um, that's one reason why smallholders continue to be in a position of disadvantage while still being connected to the European market. Okay, thank you very, very much. Um, Andrea, I'd like to turn to you with maybe a slightly provocative question. Um, there are some people that would say, you know, the idea of deleting the low risk category, is that not a risk of, um, you know, losing an incentivization to countries to do better? Perhaps you could comment on this kind of criticism and how, you know, how to kind of incentivize countries without this category. Well, I mean, uh, I, would, I would say, that incentive is, is rather hypothetical. Uh, I mean, uh, but what we are facing with the low risk country instead like is a, is a concrete risk to undermine the due diligence process uh, because I mean, the way, the way that the, and the consequence attached to the low, low risk country now is that risk assessment and risk mitigation would not be mandatory anymore. So basically, there is a, a sort of like a very limited due diligence that, that consists in, only in, in the traceability. And, uh, and what that would entail is, is a risk of, in our view, of commodity laundering. 
So basically all the risk of contamination throughout the supply chain would no longer be assessed and no longer mitigated. So uh, leaving in the, 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 low, the low risk uh, category could, could really like lead to, to a sort of like um, distortion of trade, trade fluxes and a risk of, of, of laundering, which is immediate which is immediate. Then we will have to see how, let's say, like the, the incentive plays out, especially, and, and this is how we see it, uh, in, in moving to, for countries, moving from the high risk to the standard risk. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, there is a question, oh, it's not, maybe not exactly a question, but there's a comment in the, in the Q&A um, for uh, Bojan, I think probably the best person to direct this towards. Um, from Alex uh, Wijernata, from apologies for the pronunciation, from Mighty Earth. And um, Alex would like to know about the inclusion of rubber. Um, he says Alex, uh, rubber is a, a major deforestation risk commodity, should be included um, within the scope of this. Um, Bojan, do you have any, any specific thoughts about rubber? Anything to say to that, uh, that comment? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, um, in the Commission proposal, uh, rubber is uh, not uh, covered, not covered at the moment, because we, um, according also to the procedures that uh, we need to follow, including impact assessment, uh, the results of these procedures um, pointed to the commodities that are covered at the moment. However, um, we do include in the review clause uh, that uh, very soon uh, in the future, uh, there will be the review who will look uh, also on the possibility to um, cover other commodities, including rubber, of course, um, based on the new relevant scientific information available at the moment. In the meantime, there will also then be, as for anything else, uh, the time uh, for um, the begin and first phase in implementation, uh, also to learn from. So uh, this is basically what we can what we can say at the moment. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for that comment. I'll turn uh, one last question I have here for um, Traoré. Um, so you mainly spoke about um, cocoa, of course, that's your area of expertise. But perhaps are you able to speak a little bit about other other commodities in your area. I think we'll also have a quick translation as well. Uh, you just have to unmute yourself there. La carité est muet. Attends. Ouais, je disais que j'ai entendu le début, mais la fin, j'ai pas trop compris. La question? Vous avez pas oui. compris? Ah, ok. Si vous avez certes parlé du, du cacao, est-ce que vous pouvez euh, nous parler un peu des autres produits autour euh, de vous? Oui. Euh... Bon, déjà ici, euh, comme je l'ai dit, depuis euh, 2012, la Côte d'Ivoire est engagée dans les négociations faites donc, sur le bois. Le bois fait partie euh, euh, de, de, des produits inclus dans ce règlement. Donc, euh, sur la question du bois, je pense qu'on va signer l'APE FLECT euh, ce mois de juin. Les dernières réunions, on était à un atelier il n'y a pas trop longtemps. Les dernières réunions entre les négociateurs européens et ivoiriens, le, le comité technique des négociations ont eu lieu. Et on est en train de partager la signature de l'APE FLECT. Donc, nous, la question qu'on se pose justement, c'est quel sera le lien entre la PE FLECT, l'accord avec la licence FLECT, et le règlement actuellement. C'est une question en suspens qu'on a posée il n'y a pas trop longtemps à la délégation de l'Union européenne à Abidjan. Et on n'a pas encore d'idée assez claire sur le sujet. Euh, autre chose, le café. La Côte d'Ivoire était longtemps un grand producteur de café. Mais aujourd'hui, ce n'est pas tel trop le cas. Et quand on regarde les chiffres, l'Union européenne ne se fournit pas un café beaucoup en Côte d'Ivoire, c'est beaucoup en Amérique du Sud euh, voilà, et, ou ailleurs. Donc, euh, la question du café, euh, le, le, le marché du café entre la Côte d'Ivoire et l'Union européenne, ce n'est pas vraiment quelque chose de porteur. Pourquoi tous les efforts se concentrent sur le cacao Parce que le cacao, c'est 70% du cacao produit en Côte d'Ivoire, voire sur le marché européen. Et l'Union européenne se fournit en 52%, 51-52% de cacao ivoirien. Donc, c'est pourquoi toutes les discussions sont autour du cacao, etc., Et aussi, le cacao, c'est 15 points de PIB pour la Côte d'Ivoire. Donc, ce n'est pas rien. C'est voilà, 40 des recettes d'exportation. Donc, toutes les discussions ici en Côte d'Ivoire aujourd'hui, c'est sur le cacao parce que c'est hautement stratégique. Euh, que ce soit le bœuf, le lait, euh, le café ou le bois. Le bois, il est déjà pris en compte dans la pluie Mais les autres, euh, c'est des choses euh, que la Côte d'Ivoire n'a pas tellement de relations commerciales avec lui sur ces, ces produits-là. Donc, euh, nous, on n'a on on, on pas vraiment 
focaliser nos attentions sur ces produits-là. On a focalisé nos attentions, comme on l'a fait depuis 2012 sur le bois, on a focalisé nos attentions sur le cacao parce que c'est hautement stratégique et hautement important dans, dans ces discussions. Merci beaucoup. I'll just pass the floor to Charlotte for a quick question. Juste un mot sur euh, la remarque de notre ami de Mighty Earth sur euh, oui. les VA. Sur les VA, oui, c'est quelque chose. En février euh, 2021, c'est quelque chose. Dès que nous on a eu connaissance des discussions et on a entendu parler des produits qui sont concernés, on a dit mais pourquoi pas les VA Pourquoi pas les VA Parce que les VA, en termes de euh, hostilité à la biodiversité, il n'y a pas meilleure chose. Quand il y a les VA, il n'y a plus de biodiversité, il n'y a, a rien qui pousse en bas. Le cacao, il y a des choses qui poussent en bas, il, y a des, il peut y avoir des choses, mais le, le VA, il n'y a rien qui pousse en bas. Et au, contrairement au cacao qui est en Côte d'Ivoire fait par, dans l'agriculture familiale, donc les plantations de cacao en Côte d'Ivoire, la caractéristique, c'est que ça appartient à des familles. Il n'y a pas de plantation industrielle de cacao en Côte d'Ivoire. Euh, c'est des petites plantations de 2, 3 hectares, maximum 4. Euh, les VA, il y a des plantations industrielles de VA en Côte d'Ivoire qui sont sur des grands étendues. On peut avoir 100, 200, 300 hectares de VA. Donc, euh, effectivement, on s'est expliqué très mal euh, pourquoi les VA n'avaient pas été pris en compte dans, dans les produits. Euh, mais on s'est dit qu'actuellement, les discussions sont tellement avancées. Est-ce que c'est quelque chose qui va être mis sur la table et que ça va rentrer Alors, En tout cas, ça ne serait pas mauvais de le mettre dans, dans la discussion. Mais voilà, c'est ce que je voulais dire. Je vais juste dire un petit peu de la dernière question. Oui, merci beaucoup. Je vais brièvement traduire. On the, um, on the issue of the other products, actually, Ivory Coast is uh, in negotiation for a flagged agreement since um, 10 years now. Um, so there are a lot of questions from uh, NGO and civil society in Ivory Coast between, on the link between this flagged agreement and the wood products and the, the regulation that needs to be addressed in the coming weeks and months. Um, but indeed, cocoa is the main product for, uh, for Ivory Coast because 70% of the production goes directly to Europe and it's 50% it's 15 of the um, revenues of uh, Ivory Coast. So it's mainly this product that is the targets of uh, the civil society, the small orders, um, and wood is important too, but need to be clarified the link between FLECT and this regulation. And uh, Bakari also added the issue of rubber because uh, rubber in Ivory Coast is like, they think that it must be included in the regulation because it's really bad for biodiversity and had a lot of impact on the, um, on the forest and so on. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, thank you. And I think that is all we have time for, for uh, today. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists. I'd like to thank all of you uh, tuning in. And um, just a quick reminder before you go, this webinar has been recorded and also everyone will receive an email following the events with all the links to the studies and documents mentioned throughout the webinar. So thank you very much. I'm Natasha Foote. Thank you for listening and I hope you all have a, a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much, goodbye. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir.